I, uh, I love this verse. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And, and Paul here, uh, actually Luke is doing the, the writing here, but we, we look at the end of this verse, and the end of this verse is absolutely foundational, my friends, to our Christian walk. It says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And it starts off by saying it is, it is our job as Christians to help the weak. Okay? And we do that by, by giving. And again, this is absolutely foundational to my walk with the Lord. It is more blessed to give than to receive. Last week we talked about developing a relationship with the Word of God. Hopefully spending a little bit more time in the Word than we have in the past. And one of the things we, we talked about is I believe, at least in my life, when I'm not spending the time that I believe I should in, in Scripture, it's maybe because at that moment, I'm not quite seeing the value, seeing the benefits of spending some time in the Word. Today, we look at this concept of it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I want to just throw it out to you right now. What are some of the benefits? What's the value? Why are we blessed in, in giving? Talk to me. Get out of ourselves. Pardon me, Mike? Get out of ourselves. To get out of ourselves. Blessing in that, right? I hate being in myself. What else? More blessed to give than to receive. Feels good. Feels good. There you go. I like that. Dallas. You invite the Holy Spirit for it. Okay. I think you see people um, that are in need and you're thankful for what you do. That you're not in that situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? What's that? It honors, God. it honors God. Great stuff. Rob? Yeah, see what you did actually benefit someone else's life. Mm -hmm. in action. Feels good. <laughs> Carrying the burden of others. Caring? Carrying? Carrying the burden of others? We've all been there. I think the key is to get to the point in your own life where you're doing for others without even thinking about it. Yeah. Like at one point I had all these tomatoes from a garden and all I could think of was let's get rid of them. <laughs> and I was helping me, but I didn't realize that I was helping the people that I gave them to as well. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Gary? Because my mind is fresh for Better to be last than first. To be first, you must be last. We're gonna go there. You're stealing my thunder there, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I like how Mike started that off. It gets us out of ourselves. We were talking in our group this morning about Galatians 2:20. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the more I, I worry about myself, the more stress I'm going to have in my life. It is more blessed. And that word blessed is a powerful word, word in, the, in the Greek language. It's makarios. It, it, it means fully blessed, big time. It's a strong word in the English language. But I, I love it in the Greek because it's a very powerful word. It means you will be Full on blessed. It's better to give than to receive. That is foundational, my friends, to our Christian walk. 
let's let's have another prayer. Father God, we we thank you, we love you, we need you. And right now, Lord, as I get ready to give this teaching here, I just pray that you'll you'll speak through me. Speak to our hearts today, Lord. Help us to realize the importance of this message. And Lord, we just, uh, again, we thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, question for you this morning. Kind of a tough question, too. Are you a giver, or are you a taker? Both. And, maybe a better question would be, what do the people around you say? And it's interesting, everybody's stealing my thunder. So. Uh, I want to soften that up a bit, because that's a tough question. And this is a message, my friends, that I need to hear. Because I struggle with being selfish in my life. And depending on the situation, we are, I believe, both. There are times when I'm giving, but there are times also when I'm more concerned <coughs> with, with taking. And I look at this ministry that we have here, step seven. We we focus on people that are struggling with addictions. I can tell you, and I'm very thankful, I should have mentioned this maybe earlier. Tomorrow, it will be 30 years since I checked into rehab. So I got 30 years. I'm very thankful for that. I'm very thankful for that. But when I look back on my days of the end of my using and the beginning of my sobriety. 30 years ago, you guys, I was a professional taker. Mm -hmm. Okay, and I think that's only natural when we're dealing with substance abuse. Mm -hmm. I would wake up, I, how am I going to find some money? Where am I going to get a bottle? Where am I going to get a hit? How am I going to take care of my addiction? Take Take, take. And it's only natural that we see that in folks that are new in sobriety. But having said all that, after 30 years, I still struggle with selfishness. It's interesting because earlier today, Rob even mentioned at the end of the class, he, we talked about what? The, the journey, right, Rob? We're, we're on a journey here. It's not about the destination. The destination is when the skies part and the good Lord takes us home. There's, there's our destination. But in the meantime, I'm on a path. And today I want to be more of a giver than a taker. And it will bless you. My friends, that's what the Bible teaches us. Uh, the good news through all of this is that right this very moment, and we talk about now a lot around here, right in this very moment I can make a decision that today I'm going to be more of a giver. Amen. Okay, I'm going to do that today. I'm going to do that moment by moment. Maybe situation by situation mm -hmm. that I walk into. I'm going to give that some thought. Acts 20. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And those aren't just pretty words, my friends. Those are real words. You will be blessed if you think along those lines. I want to look at two examples here. Turn to Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew. And these are some stories that we've looked at before, especially the second one that we're going to look at. 
This is the one that Gary just alluded to, right here. This is the story of James and John. And they, they asked their mommy to go make a request of, of Jesus. What was that, Jim? Matthew. Matthew 20. Matthew 20. <coughs> and in the NIV, at least in my version of the NIV, it says a mother's request is the title here. And I'm going to start in verse 20. And it says here, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons, and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? he asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You don't know what you are asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup? I'm going to drink. We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right or left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Keep your finger there. Look at this story here. We have, we have James and John. And I, I'm not sure, but I kind of have a feeling they, they recruited Mommy to go talk to Jesus, to go get something, something pretty large in my mind. You know, they figure this is the Son of God, this is the Messiah, the Christ, and all they really want to do is have a seat next to him in the kingdom. Pretty big request here. Huge take. Notice what she does. How does she do it? She does it on her knees, my friends. She's almost begging here for Jesus to grant this request. Kneeling down, ask a favor of him. <laughs> I love Jesus. He asks such wonderful questions. <coughs> what, you know, just so direct. What is it you want? You know, he knew they're here for something. They want to take something. You know, he just, his question asking, I just love it. Um, Jesus does something here that we notice in a lot of his teachings, too. We're going to see that he, he finds a teaching opportunity in front of him here. And a lot of the times when he finds these wonderful opportunities, it's based around emotion. It's a very passionate moment is taking place, and he recognizes a teaching moment. And he has one right here. Notice the, the beginning of verse 24. When the ten, the other apostles, when the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Emotion. They're mad. These ten guys are mad. It goes on to say, Jesus called them together and said. So what does he do? He sees this teaching opportunity and he brings them all together. Time to do some teaching here, he says. Jesus called them together and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Big stuff right there. Not so with you, Jesus is telling you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for men. Wonderful message here. He starts it off by saying, not so with you. You are different. We are to serve, Jesus says. It is more blessed to give than to receive, my friends. And these blessings will be real in your life. Turn, please, to John 13. And this is are some ver these are some verses here that I've probably overdone up front here. I just used them a few weeks ago on Holy Thursday when we got together with Providence Presbyterian. 
But there is so much going on in this teaching that it probably should be brought up two or three times a year from the pulpit. We have the story of the Passover meal. This is right before Jesus is getting ready to, to go to the cross. And John 13, I'm going to start in... I'm going to start in verse 2. It says here, The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God, and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, I've come to these verses quite a few times, as I just mentioned, but I want to point out a few things today that I just love about this. This is the Passover meal. This is a big deal here. We read in, in Luke that Jesus sent off Peter and John to go make arrangements for this Passover meal, which they did. They forgot something, though. They forgot to have a slave there to wash the apostles' feet. Pretty major blunder, actually. These, these men come to this meal. It's the Passover. They are expecting someone there to wash their feet. Okay. And again, we have this moment that Jesus sees and he seizes upon it. He capitalizes on it. He's going to the cross. Within hours, he's going to the cross. And they're having this Passover meal. But there isn't a slave here to wash their feet. And this is the lowest job there is in Jerusalem at the time. There are different kinds of servants, slaves, back in the day. You could be a Hebrew slave. Or you could be a foreigner. Hebrew slaves weren't even allowed to do this job. It was such a low job. You had to be a foreign slave to wash the feet. Think about it. These guys are in there. And the, 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 input, the tools are probably there. We know they're there. Jesus goes and gets them. There's this table over there that has probably the water basin and the, and the jar and the towel. And I bet you everybody's kind of just trying to ignore it. I bet it was screaming at them. But nobody gets up to take on this job. Then what happens? Jesus stands up and walks over there. Mm -hmm. I bet you could cut the air in there with a knife. Jesus has an incredible teaching moment in front of him. And he's going to the cross the next day. Most of these guys are going to desert him. He's going to be all alone hanging on a cross for them. And he gets up and he goes and gets the, the towel and the water. Let's... Uh, Let's read on here. It says, He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, Peter said, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, A person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. 
I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be what? Blessed. Blessed. Same word we see in Acts chapter 20. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Not only will you be blessing, you will be blessed if you do them. Now I often talk. He's not telling him here to go out and see how many people's feet you can wash today. You know, here's another question in here that I absolutely love. It's Jesus just getting to the point. Look at what he says uh, up in verse 12. The end of verse 12 there. He asks him the question, Do you understand what I have done for you? And I would imagine maybe a couple of the simple ones, the more dull ones, were saying, yeah, you washed, you took care of what needed to be done. You washed my feet. Jesus says, though, do you understand what I have done for you. He's given us a lesson here, you guys, in service, in, in giving. And there's not a greater lesson that we as Christians can take to heart. It is more blessed to give than to receive. And he says, if you do this, you will be blessed. It's not about us anymore. It's all about Him. We are to serve. Acts chapter 20. It is more blessed to give than to receive. I want to I wanna close with a story here that uh, took place in my life a long time ago, something I'm not real proud of, but it happened. <coughs> when I got sober, <coughs> I've been a broker, a real estate broker, all my life. Uh, I kind of figured out I'm going to go out and get rich. I'm going to go out and I'm going to take all the energy that I used on getting high, and I'm going to go chase the almighty dollar. I'm going to go get rich. And I had a partner. He was my cousin. And we used to flip real estate. We would buy and sell homes. Some of them we'd fix up. Others we would just buy right and sell and make a profit. This one deal... And I learned a ton from this lesson. The Lord really hit me hard here. I had a friend who was a lender, and they got in touch with me and said that this one real estate deal was crashing. And they knew that we would buy and close quickly and pay cash. And it's interesting, it was a Denver Bronco bought a home over here on Downing Street, over at Washington Park. And it was a beautiful home, and it sat right on Downing, right across from this, where the flowers are. If you're not, I don't know if you're familiar with Washington mm -hmm. Park, but I remember this deal like it was yesterday. This lender called me up and said, can you, can you bail us out here? The person, the buyer was this Denver Bronco. And his mom came to town, looked at the house, and didn't like it. And he put $10,000 earnest money down on this house, and he just walked away from it. He said, I don't care, I'll, I'm not going to close. Turns out that the seller was in the middle of a divorce, was in the middle of filing bankruptcy, and the house was going into foreclosure. This lender called me up and said, we need, we need $168,000. I remember writing up the contract. We, we closed on the deal, and I remember the settlement sheet being faxed over to me before I went to the closing, and I was just as excited as I can be. I was going to make $50,000. I sold that property in a couple of days. And I looked at the settlement sheet and said, wow, $50,000, not a bad deal. Went to the closing, though, and sat down, and it was me and my partner and the buyer and the closing agent. And the closing agent asked me, would you like me, Mr. Roth, to go over the, the settlement sheet? And I said, no, you don't have to. I've seen it. I've checked it. That's right. I know the check that I'm getting. Then she looked at the seller, and it was this woman. And 
she asked him, would you like me to go over the settlement sheet with you? And the woman broke down. And this was a day that I was supposed to celebrate. This was a big victory. The woman broke down and she said, you know what? You don't need to go over the settlement sheet with me. And she's crying as she's saying this. She said, the judge has ordered me to sign it. I was taking this woman's equity, $50,000 that was hers, and it, it broke me. I was supposed to go out and have a big lunch afterwards and celebrate this situation, and I will never forget that day. I took this woman's equity in her house. Acts chapter 20 says, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And folks, that's the truth. I want to be known. I want to be known as a giver. And I hope you all have the same desire in your heart to be known as a giver. Are you uh, part of the problem? Or are you part of the solution. I ask you today, I beg and pray that you wake up in the morning and you think today, am I going to be a giver or am I going to be a taker? Moment by moment, as I said a second ago, situational. I'm going into this situation right here. Be intentional about being in the moment. Am I going to give or am I going to take? And my friends, the more we grow ice, the more we're going to understand that the more I give, the more He's going to bless me. Amen. The more Amen. peace of mind that I'm going to have. Amen. We, we look today at two messages. One in Matthew, where Jesus says, No, not so with you. Not so with you. We don't live like the world lives. We look in John. And Jesus says, you'll be blessed if you do this. What a wonderful gift. Right before He goes and does what? Gives us the greatest gift of all the next day. Which is what? The cross of Christ. Again, I ask you today, are you a giver or are you a taker? And we're going to be both. But let's be intentional about focusing on the giving. And let's think about the wonderful cross of Christ, the greatest gift of all. Amen. Amen. Yes, let's thank Him for that. <clears throat> Lord, we, we love You. We thank You for this lesson that you, you reiterated to us on a few occasions, Lord. You told us that it's not about us anymore. Not so with you, you said. Help us to remember that. Help us to remember that we will be blessed, Lord, by blessing others. Help us to take a moment in the moment to think about the situation we're walking into and how it is we're going to handle that situation. Am I going to go into this with a taker's attitude, or am I going to come into this with what is it that I have to offer? Lord, we long to give. Help us here at Step 7 to be a giving ministry. And we just thank you, Lord, and we love you, and as we always do, we lift up our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.